Assistance Coordinator at the Virginia Department of Health. Today, I'll be providing an update on the public health response to targeted MDROs. Targeted MDROs are pre-endemic stages of spread for which a coordinated public health response to identified cases is an important strategy to limit transmission. Therefore, targeted MDROs would include the following, vancomycin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, carbapenemase producing organisms, and Canada auris. The Virginia Department of Health follows CDC guidance to contain these targeted organisms. CDC recently updated their guidance document known as the containment strategy and released a new guidance document with recommendations to prevent the spread. Today, I will be focusing the majority of the presentation on the updated containment strategy guidance, but we'll also briefly review the main points of the prevention guidance. The containment strategy guidance was last updated in 2019, so the 2023 updates are to reflect new findings from our response efforts and to reflect evolving practices by linking some of our response to targeted prevention activities. It was also updated to clarify common points of confusion um, that CDC noticed. The key updates to the guidance include revising the tier definition that impact those response activities. The organisms that are included in each tier are dictated by each state or jurisdiction. Previous guidance included three tiers, with tier one including the most rare organisms and thus the most aggressive public health response. Tier one previously included organisms that are not susceptible to any available antimicrobials, but in this update, those organisms will now be classified as tier two. There was also another tier that was added called tier four to describe actions that should be taken for targeted MDROs that are endemic in a jurisdiction or state. The update has also expanded the response recommendations with more details, which includes more information about infection control assessments and changes in contact screening recommendations. Before I dive into the specific response actions, I will first review the Virginia case counts and the organisms for each tier. This table lists the CDC definition for each tier and the organisms that fall under the tier specific for Virginia. Tier one is now limited to novel organisms and or resistance mechanisms that have never or very rarely been identified in the United States and for which experience is extremely limited, thus requiring a more extensive evaluation. In Virginia, that would be any novel resistant mechanism and versa. Isolates that are not susceptible to any available antimicrobials, but whose transmission dynamics are well known, are now classified as Tier 2. Please note that this classification change does not change overall recommended response activities when a pan-non-susceptible isolate is identified. Tier 2 also includes MDROs not commonly identified in the region. So for Virginia, this includes carbapenem-resistant uh, Enterobacter rallies, Pseudomonas, and Acinetobacter with specific carbapenemase mechanisms that are more rarely identified. It would also include Canada auris. Tier 3 represents organisms that have been identified frequently across the region but are not considered to be endemic. In Virginia, that is carbapenem resistant Enterobacter rallies with the KPC carbapenemase resistance mechanism and carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter with specific oxacillinase mechanisms. Tier four is included on the chart, but Virginia does not have any MDROs that fall under this category. VDH does review the tier designations periodically to determine if changes should be made. VDH also works with CDC and neighboring states to review our data to inform any necessary changes. The data reviewed to inform any changes are collected from our Virginia Electronic Disease Surveillance System. This slide shows Canada Oris cases in Virginia reported to VDH by April 15th of this year um, by year and by region. The graph on the left-hand side shows cases by year starting in 2018 and going through April 15th, 2023, and is broken down by clinical and screening cases. Clinical cases are in yellow and screening cases are in orange. Screening cases are identified from our response of a clinical case, so our screening cases are likely underrepresenting the true picture, as clinical cases are most likely just the tip of our iceberg. Our data shows cases have been increasing each year, with the graph on the right showing the regional breakdown of our cases during that same time period, and similarly broken out by clinical and screening cases. The northern and central regions have the most cases reported, however cases have been identified in all Virginia regions. I will now move on to our carbapenemase producing organisms data. This graph shows the number of reported cases starting in January 2019 through December of 2022. 
The yellow line are the total number of CPO cases, so both clinical and screening cases combined. The orange line um, shows just our Enterobacterialis clinical cases and is included to show how the majority of our reported cases are from clinical at Enterobacterialis cases. But the same statement I made regarding the Canada Aura screening cases also applies to the carbapenemase producing organisms. The last line, which is that brown line, is the number of pseudomonas uh, cases uh, of clinical cases. It continues to be very rare that carbapenem resistant pseudomonas isolates produce a carbapenemase, um, as is depicted by the low numbers. Since Enterobacterialis is the reason for the majority of our cases, I wanted to provide a spotlight on some additional data. The graph on the right shows the breakdown of each of the carbapenem mechanisms identified by year. The majority of our cases are attributed to KPC, which is in blue. However, the percentage of MDM cases, which are in gray, are increasing. And I apologize, this is the graph on the left. Uh, the graph on the right shows the three most common enterobacterialis organisms that are reported to have a carbapenemase mechanism. Klebsiella pneumoniae is by far the most common. And within Klebsiella pneumoniae, we most often see the KPC mechanism. Again, that is the, the blue color. We commonly see the same with Enterobacter cloicae, but with E. coli, if it is a carbapenemase producer, we are more likely to detect the NDM mechanism as compared to KPC. These data and more information is available on the respective BDH websites. For C. auris, we do update case counts monthly, and for CPO, we update those quarterly. Now that I've reviewed the tier designations, I will go into the response steps. The goals have remained fairly the same in the updated guidance, but I will review them again for everyone. First, we want to identify affected patients quickly and ensure appropriate control measures are promptly implemented to limit further spread. We also aim to determine if transmission is occurring, which is more suited for our tier one and tier two responses and not so much tier three. If there are novel organisms or mechanisms, we want to characterize those to guide response actions, and then lastly, coordinate our containment response with ongoing prevention activities. There are six response strategies that are recommended in the CDC containment guidance. The initial response measure is to facilitate prompt implementation of appropriate infection prevention and control measures. So contact precautions if not already implemented for another indication for the index patient at the facility where they are currently admitted to prevent transmission. The next strategy is to conduct a healthcare investigation, which will identify healthcare settings at risk of transmission from the index patient. We will also ensure adherence to infection prevention and control or IPC. This is accomplished by assessments and ongoing support of measures to support high levels of adherence to recommended infection control practices at facilities where the index patient received care and including the facility where the patient or resident is currently receiving care. Another response strategy is conducting a contact investigation, which is screening to identify individuals with a targeted MDRO to facilitate implementation of appropriate precautions and to evaluate for potential transmission. There is also clinical laboratory surveillance to assess for additional cases and augment other case detection activities and a strategy for environmental sampling, um, which are addressed for each tier, but that does not mean that they are routinely recommended for each tier. tier. They are not recommended for tier three and rarely for tier one and tier two. We will now review the recommendations for each response strategy, starting with the initial response. The facility responsibilities include promptly notifying the patient's primary healthcare provider, healthcare personnel caring for the patient, the infection control department, and other healthcare staff per facility policies. The facility should also notify the local health department promptly and implement contact precautions or enhanced barrier precautions if they are in a nursing home. Notify the patient about the results and infection control measures being implemented. And then if the MDRO was present on admission, notifying the transferring facility so appropriate investigation can occur at that facility as well. We also ask that facilities provide the local health departments with information as requested. Our public health responsibilities include notifying the federal public health authorities, prioritizing the facility for a rapid infection control assessment to identify and address any potential gaps, ensure implementation of appropriate infection control measures, and then also um, to help 
with that transfer of communication. So if the MDR was present on admission, notifying the transferring facility um, if we're told which that transfer facility was so that an appropriate investigation can occur um, there as well. The next response strategy is the healthcare investigation. In general, the healthcare investigation in response to new identification of tier three organisms has a narrower scope than for tier organisms, tier two organisms and tier one, and that is reflected in the different objectives. So for tier one, our objective is to evaluate and define the risk for transmission and the extent of spread and implement measures to prevent transmission. For tier two, it's a slightly narrower, so identifying the extent of spread and implement measures to prevent further transmission. And then for tier three, identifying patients and finding and addressing gaps in detection or infection control that could facilitate transmission. The time frame for the healthcare investigation does vary depending on the tier. Um, for tier one, it's going to be at least 30 days. This is going to be uh, where we have our, our most broad time frame um, prior to the initial positive specimen collection up until the present. For tier two, this will range anywhere from 30 to 90 days um, from the initial positive culture, um, depending on resources and the amount of healthcare exposure that each of these uh, cases have. And then tier three, we really limit it to the, the current admission. The exposures of interest that we're looking for are similar for tier one and tier two. So overnight stays in healthcare settings, both domestic and international, outpatient visits, home health visits, um, to really identify facilities where transmission could have occurred. For tier three, however, again, narrower scope, we're really just looking for overnight stays in that healthcare setting, specifically um, their, their current or the one that they previously came from. And then there is some priority information that's recommended from CDC for us to collect um, that's specifically listed for tier one and tier two. They don't list anything for tier three, but our investigation steps will be similar um, in what we collect. Um, so this includes the in index patients admissions and discharge dates, the care locations within a facility, the presence and duration of roommates, types of care received, so respiratory therapy, wound care, invasive medical devices, the functional status of the patient, um, laboratory culture and screening results for the organism of interest, and then also wanting to ask about any international health care exposure. Moving on to the next response strategy, we have adherence to infection prevention and control. This slide lists the healthcare facility responsibilities, which include educating and informing the healthcare personnel and visitors for the index patient about the organism and precautions indicated to prevent transmission, ensuring that adequate supplies are available to implement transmission-based or enhanced barrier precautions, conducting ongoing adherence monitoring of infection control practices and providing feedback to healthcare personnel, flagging the affected patient's medical records to initiate appropriate infection control precautions upon readmission, and then making a plans for how receiving facilities will be notified of affected patients MDRO status. And I do wanna note, um, and this is also in the CDC guidance, that a decision to discharge a patient from one level of care to another um, should not be based on clinical, should be based on clinical criteria and not on colonization status. And we know that communicating these MDR results have been a challenge. So to help aid in the transfer of information, VDH has worked with the Virginia Health Information to add MDR flags in the already established Emergency Department Care Coordination or the EDCC system. Some background on the system is that in 2017, the General Assembly established the EDC program within the Virginia Department of Health to provide a single statewide technology solution that connects healthcare facilities. Connect Virginia, um, which is now a program of the Virginia Health Information, was contracted by VDH to fulfill the requirements of this legislation. And then Collective Medical was chosen as the EDCC program technology partner. CPO and CORIS cases entered in, into our Virginia electronic disease surveillance system are sent to collect this collective medical system twice a week and will show up in enrolled facilities electronic health records when patients are admitted. This slide shows an example of what that flag would look like in the system. It includes if it's either CORIS or CPO, a description of where to find additional IPC information, and then the date it was attributed on. <clears throat> All acute care hospitals and some long-term care facilities are enrolled in the EDCC, but enrolled facilities still need to turn on the MDRO notifications to get these flags. Each of the enrolled facilities have a point of contact for the EDCC, 
So if you do happen to know who that is in your facility, please reach out to them to have them turn on the notifications. If you don't know who your contact is, you can reach out to the point click, point click care and collective medical support to make that connection and have your MDO notifications turned on. Any long-term care facility that would like to onboard in the system, please contact the BHI email address on this slide. And please note, facilities should still communicate MDRO status on transfer. These EDCC alerts are not a replacement, just an addition. So we took a, a brief detour from the guidance, um, but now we are back and are still on adhering to the IPC response strategy, um, where I will now review the, the public health responsibilities. So for tier one and tier two, CDC does recommend health departments conduct on-site assessments at all healthcare facilities identified in the investigation, and follow-up visits are recommended to ensure that any IPC gaps are addressed. Now we can identify a numerous amount of facilities during these healthcare investigations. Um, so there are recommendations for which facilities to prioritize. And that includes uh, the facility currently caring for the index patient, any facilities with evidence of transmission, and then high acuity post-acute care facilities like LTACs and VSNPs. For tier three, um, not, not as uh, broad of a, a recommendation. So CDC recommends health departments conduct on-site IPC assessments only at healthcare facilities where transmission is identified. And then we can also consider um, IPC assessments for the following if they haven't had an assessment recently, um, which include those high acuity post-acute care facilities, facilities that regularly share patients with high acuity post-acute care facilities, and then facilities with fewer infection control resources than most other facilities. This slide lists out what you would expect during a visit um, from the health department if they are doing an on-site IPC assessment. Um, so we really break it down into two different sections. So there's a policy review and then observations. So under policy review, some of these things might be requested to be set prior to the visit to aid um, during that on-site visit. So policies for hand hygiene, uh, PPE, environmental services, MDRO surveillance, and water management. And then if the facility conducted audits, um, if they have the results for their hand hygiene, PPE, and EVS, that might also be requested. For the observations, um, they do use a standardized assessment tool. However, these visits are tailored to each of the situations, um, but in general, uh, these are the, the main things that will always be reviewed um, for one of these response assessments. Um, and so during the observations, um, they'll look at hand hygiene and PPE use on the um, specified floors and environmental cleaning and disinfection. And then after the report, um, there, after the visit, there will be a report that's sent. So they'll provide written recommendations, summarizing strengths um, for IPC improvement, and then also provide evidence-based resources and most likely schedule a follow-up discussion to review implemented changes and progress towards addressing those IPC gaps. This slide just has the IPC resources for healthcare facilities that are available on our different websites, BDH and CDC. Um, so we have specific CORIS and CPO recommendations um, by facility type. Um, we also have um, Staphylococcus aureus, some specific visa versa guidance. Um, and then I wanted to point out for the nursing homes, um, we do have the enhanced barrier precautions, um, both CDC and BDH has information. And then we just have a general infection prevention and control website um, with, with other resources uh, that may be applicable. Now I'm moving on to the next response strategy, which is the contact screening. Um, and so the first couple of slides just review the major changes. So first, um, the change, we removed contact precautions as an exemption for screening. Um, so we know that isolation and contact precautions reduce transmission from infected or colonized patients to others. And so in the previous 2019 guidance, they did include um, recommendations to exempt uh, broader screening if the index case was on contact precautions throughout um, their entire stay and adherence was deemed high by the health department. Well, we know that adherence is highly variable, unfortunately. Um, there may be some differences by facility type, 
Um, but with this recommendation, CDC did receive a lot of feedback from health departments about that existing language. So there are challenges to assess adherence in a timely fashion. And then during this period, the number of contacts available to screen really dwindles. And also this did not address when patient was on contact precautions, but maybe appropriate disinfectants um, were not used. Um, and that's more specific to, to Canada ORIS. So the updated recommendation, it is not necessary to evaluate contact precaution adherence to recommend broader screening. However, we still wanna consider contacts, including the patient characteristics and facility practices. The next change um, is an addition um, where they now recommend screening patients who currently occupy the room. Um, the rationale for this is due to the risk of the persistent environmental contamination for some organisms, so specifically Acinetobacter and Canada Oris, and transmission through plumbing um, for some of these other organisms like the Enterobacteriales and Pseudomonas. Um, we do want to take into account the patients that are currently admitted to the room. So for tier one and tier two, um, it is recommended to screen patients currently admitted to rooms and bed spaces where the index patient stayed at least one night in healthcare facilities identified during the investigation. We will be considering the time the contact has been in a room and time elapsed since the index patient was present when planning the screening. Um, and so the short time for contact in room or a long time since the index patient was present will probably make screening lower yield in those situations. And then the last major change um, before I get into the specifics uh, for the tiers um, is that there is a, a now a generally recommended that broader screening should occur. Um, and so with this, um, they do prioritize extensive contact screening, such as a point prevalence survey and or screening of targeted contacts, specifically for settings with high acuity patients um, and longer lengths of stay and then any setting in which the index case likely acquired the organism during this day. There are some exceptions to this broader screening, um, and it's the index, if the index patient has a very short length of stay and the facility is low acuity, or acute care hospital units with a short average length of stay where patients are ambulatory, not mechanically ventilated, and more than seven days has passed since the patient was discharged. In the interest of time, I'm not going to review the tier one screening recommendations. They are similar to tier two, um, but like I mentioned, we do not have many tier one responses. Um, so I'm gonna focus on tier two and then tier three. So for tier two, um, based on what I just presented on the changes, so we, we still have screening roommates and patients who shared a bathroom with the index patient as a recommendation. Um, if the, these patients were discharged to another inpatient setting, we would want to screen the patient. If they are discharged to the home, we're going to ask the facility to consider flagging the patient's chart and implement preemptive contact precautions and admission screening if readmitted, readmitted in the next six months. Um, this guidance has been similar. Um, this hasn't been updated from the 2019 uh, guidance document. Um, the next bullet point includes this new recommendation. So screening the patient currently admitted to rooms and bed spaces where the index patient stayed at least one night. And then in most situations, perform broader screening to comprehensively assess for transmission. They do say that broader screening using PPS is preferred. However, we can still uh, take do the broader screening of the initial targeted contacts. Um, and that would be those who are at risk uh, due to overlap on the same ward as the index patient and have a presence of a risk factor for MDRO acquisition and who are still admitted. So this is that risk factor screening. So broader screening um, in the guidance is basically point prevalence survey um, or targeted screening, or you can do both in some situations. And so when deciding to use that risk factor-based approach, PPS, or a combination of both strategies, um, CDC recommends that the following should be considered. So if it's going to take several days to identify higher risk contacts, or if most higher risk contacts have been discharged from a facility, performing a unit-wide PPS sur uh, survey should happen. Facilities should consider flagging charts of those contacts who have been discharged to facilitate preemptive contact precautions and admission screening if they are readmitted in the next six months. And then if these individuals have been discharged to high acuity post acute care, uh, we in the health department will consider uh, reaching out and screening these individuals. And we will be using the prioritization on the right hand side um, to help guide in that. So healthcare settings with high acuity patients and longer lengths of stay, um, or any setting where the index case likely acquired the organism during their stay. 
Other considerations um, for this broader screening, you know, public health laboratory capacity, individual facility characteristics, and then index patient characteristics um, will be considered. The next uh, couple slides include recommendations if transmission is suspected or identified. Um, so it is recommended to do water point prevalence surveys um, if there is evidence or suspicion for ongoing transmission or if that initial targeted screening of those high-risk patients identifies new cases. And so in that situation, periodic point prevalence surveys are recommended until transmission is controlled. Um, the control definition has now um, been, been changed slightly. Um, so it uh, was control is generally de de defined as two consecutive point prevalence surveys with no new MDR cases identified. So that um, is what the definition was always, but they've now added or in facilities that have high colonization pressure defined as greater than 30%, um, you can have substantially decreased transmission and that can be your control definition. In healthcare facilities with high colonization pressure, sort of after transmission is controlled, we might um, and we should consider continuing point prevalence surveys at sort of increasing intervals to ensure that transmission remains low. And then health departments will also assess um, if facilities would benefit from any proactive prevention focus point prevalence surveys and then also infection control assessments after response activities have concluded. The other recommendation um, if transmission is identified or suspected um, is SM admission screening. Um, so they do now include some specific guidance uh, of when to consider admission screening in these situations. So admission screening can help distinguish importation from ongoing transmission within a healthcare facility, um, such as in situations where the tier two organism or mechanism is believed to be present at other facilities in the region. Um, and it's recommended to prioritize admission screening in settings with good adherence to recommended infection control practices due to the higher likelihood that identification on admission will reduce intra-facility transmission. Public health laboratory supported admission screening may be available for a time limited period um, that might be about three months. And then after an initial pilot period, the facility um, in public health will evaluate the utility of continuing admission screening as a long term prevention strategy. And then the last um, recommendation for when transmission is occurring is this regional approach. And so this first bullet point, you know, we are, we are all in this together. Um, the only way we can really prevent transmission in Virginia is if we all, all healthcare facilities kind of lean in and work together. Um, we really do need to avoid the blame game. And so um, during these investigations, the local health department may ask a facility about their transfer patterns and ask which facilities they commonly transfer with um, because there are recommendations to implement measures to reduce the risk of further MDR spread within the region at facilities known to regularly admit or receive patients from the facility where transmission occurred. And so what VDH would do with this information is kind of look at, look at the facilities and depending on the acuity, recommend an infection control assessment, potentially admission screening or point prevalence surveys at high acuity post-acute care facilities, especially if they're not engaging in prevention activities. <coughs> And before I move on from sort of our transmission section, um, I just want to take this time to say that, you know, transmission does happen. No healthcare facility really wants to bring harm to their patients or residents. We know that. We know that no healthcare facility wants to bring harm to patients or residents, even in their transfer networks. We know that there's, this is a lot of work and everyone is doing their, their best under the circumstances and with the resources you've been given. Um, but sometimes transmission does happen and might continue to happen. And this can cause frustration and anxiety and maybe some four letter words. Um, so really what to do. We don't want anyone to give up. Infection control improvements do take time, but they are always worth the effort. Don't get too focused on the PPS results alone. You can define other measures of success and celebrate them, including you know, some of the infection prevention and control audits, um, increasing you know, hand hygiene or environmental services. Um, don't get too focused on where the patient resident acquired the MDRO. If they're in your facility, it is up to you to limit the transmission. 
Um, and so just rounding out the recommendations for the tier two screening, um, I just wanted to address the healthcare personnel screening and the household contact screening, because I know that we get questions about this. Um, the guidance has remained the same. Um, it's rare that we would recommend healthcare personnel or health, household contact screening. Um, now moving on to the tier three contact screening recommendations. So CDC does allow for some broad latitude in screening recommendations for tier three organisms. And I just want to say that, you know, the recommendations may differ in intensity as we start to work through more of these tier three cases and work through this guidance um, and implement some prevention strategies that I'll talk about um, in, a, in very shortly. And then we also need to take into account laboratory capacity um, if we're using the public health lab for, for any screening. We know that, you know, lower yield um, is going to be situations where it was a short time for contact in a room or a long time since the index patient was present. Um, so we really don't really want to focus on that. Um, and then broader screening will be prioritized for the following. So facilities with a long average length of stay, um, and if the facility is not participating in any targeted MD or prevention activities, if the index patient likely acquired the organism during their stay, or there is evidence or suspicion for transmission on the unit. Um, I mentioned that the um, new guidance now has uh, recommendations to screen those that are currently admitted um, to the room where the index case might, st might stay. For tier three, um, generally screening patients that is currently admitted to the room occupied by the index case would only be performed with an epilink or a suspicion of an outbreak. Um, so that new recommendation does not apply for tier three organisms. Um, and then just because I wanted to talk a little bit more about, you know, screening and, and where that happens in Virginia and how it happens in Virginia, I included this map um, that, that represents the CDC's Antibiotic Resistance Lab Network, or the ARLN. Um, and so Virginia is located in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, so our regional lab that does a lot of our testing and screening, in addition to DCLS, um, is at the Maryland Public Health Lab. Um, so currently, um, our specimens for colonization screenings are sent to the Maryland Public Health Lab for C. oris and CPO testing, the colonization screening. Please work with your local health department on identifying who to screen, when to collect, and what to collect. Um, we know that our state public health lab, DCLS, is working on validating some more colonization screening to hopefully increase our capacity. Um, there isn't a timeline for, for when that will happen. So again, continue to follow the processes laid out by your local health department. Depending on the organism that um, the focus organism that that we're responding to, there are different screening sites. Um, so for CR and CRPA, it's a rectal swab. Um, for Acinetobacter, it's a composite axilla groin and potentially also a rectal swab. And then for C or it's a composite axilla groin. Um, the turnaround time from specimen collection is about three to seven days, so it's not very rapid. And the public health labs do not perform testing on weekends or holidays. Um, when you go about screening, we will provide you with, with more specific information, and there is some more information on our website regarding screening. The other response strategy, um, the second to last one, is clinical laboratory surveillance. Um, so the recommendations are that laboratories should perform prospective surveillance for at least three months after identification of the index patient, or if transmission is identified through surveillance or screening, three months after the last case is identified. And then also performing retrospective surveillance, so these laboratory lookbacks of results from these clinical laboratories to identify organisms with similar resistance patterns extending three months prior to identification of the index case. Now, due to Virginia isolate forward requirements, clinical laboratory surveillance might not be applicable as recommended in the CDC guidance. This guidance um, has stayed uh, the same from the 2019 guidance, um, so no changes here. Um, but I did want to point out that one major exception um, might be uh, our, acinita, our carbapenem resistant acinetobacter or crab, or if there's laboratories that are not following isolate submission requirements. And so I just want to take this time to just review our Virginia reportable disease list specifically to the target MDROs. So on the left hand side, we have the list of, uh, of cases of physicians and directors of medical care facilities should report these suspected or confirmed cases to the local health department within three days. Um, so first, you know, Canada oris infection or colonization, carbapenemase producing organisms, or vancomycin intermediate or vancomycin resistant staphylococcus aureus. 
And then we also have this isolate forwarding requirement. So laboratories should forward these isolates if they are identified to DCLS within seven days. Um, so we have Canada aureus, Canada aureus, Canada hemoloniae, suspected Canada aureus as indicated by CDC algorithm, carbapenem resistance enterobacterales, carbapenem resistant pseudomonas, and then vancomycin intermediate staphylococcus aureus and vancomycin resistant um, staphylococcus aureus. So CRAB isolates can be forwarded to DCS on a voluntary basis for this additional carbapenemase testing. And we do have um, a number of facilities of clinical laboratories that are doing that. Um, so we thank you because it does aid in our surveillance activities. Um, but I did just want to point out um, that CRAB is not required to be sent. Um, so if we were doing a response to CRAB, um, the clinical laboratory surveillance uh, prospective and um, forward would be recommended. And then rounding out uh, the response recommendations, we have environmental cultures. Um, so for tier one, the threshold to do environmental cultures is generally lower, um, especially for organisms for which the role of the environment in transmission um, you know, might not be understood. Um, environmental cultures for tier two are recommended only if transmission is identified or suspected, and there is epidemiological evidence impl implicating an environmental reservoir. For tier three, um, they're generally not recommended. If Environmental sampling is going to take place. Um, CDC recommends that uh, the facilities consult with a laboratory that has experience processing environmental samples, um, work with a laboratory to develop an environmental sampling strategy, and consult with experts to interpret results. Um, the CDC guidance, um, and I, I linked this on the first page, um, there are um, a lot of FAQs that they have provided in addition to this guidance, and there is an FAQ specifically talking about environmental culturing that does have more information. Um, and then this is just the summary of the response elements that I just talked about um, for tier one, tier two, and tier three. Um, so just to review them. So for a healthcare investigation, the recommendation to review the patient's healthcare exposures, we're going to look for tier one at least 30 days, tier two anywhere between 30 to 90 days, and tier three, the current or sometimes prior admission. Ensuring adherence to IPC, those infection prevention and control assessments, they are recommended for tier one and tier two. For contact investigations, uh, screening for roommates and screening additional healthcare contacts um, will usually occur um, for tier three and then always for tier one and tier two. And then screening household contacts and screening healthcare personnel for tier two and tier three would not be recommended. There's recommendations, of course, if transmission is identified um, with repeating PPS at regular intervals for tier one and tier two, but not for tier three. And then the clinical surveillance, um, like I mentioned, and then the environmental sampling, which is, is rare that that's recommended. Um, and then I just wanted to go through the tier four guidance. So this is not uh, containment, um, but like I said, they did add this new tier um, uh, and some response steps that uh, the health department might, might recommend. Again, as of right now, Virginia currently doesn't have any organisms that would fall under this tier four guidance. Um, but in the event that we would, um, we would ensure that healthcare facilities and providers promptly receive testing results to facilitate implementation of appropriate infection prevention and control measures, confirm the measures are in place to ensure adherence to infection prevention and control and communication of patient MDR status at transfer. We'd also want to prioritize prevention measures, um, which I will talk about um, in a few minutes, and then remain vigilant uh, for outbreaks and changes in regional epidemiology that may suggest additional measures. Um, so enhanced screening, expansion of prevention activities, um, this would be sort of our, our outbreak guidance. This webinar and slides will be added to our VDH website, um, and I believe Sarah also included uh, the PDF of these slides for those of you that are on this call um, in the chat. Um, I also wanted to point you to some additional topics of webinars and slides that are also available on our MDO containment webinar series. This series has been conducted over the past few years um, in conjunction with CDC and some of our neighboring states. And so the topics um, that, that are available right now are the role of hand hygiene Hygiene, healthcare facility, environmental cleaning and disinfection, enhanced barrier precautions in nursing homes, simplifying carbapenem resistant organisms, CORS and CPO colonization screening, and then outbreaks and water management. Um, and I highly recommend everyone to visit this site um, and review uh, these webinars or, or look at the slides. 
Um, so now with the, my remaining time, I will be going over this new guidance, the public health strategies to prevent the spread of novel and targeted multidrug resistant organisms. So the CDC MDO prevention guidance formalizes proactive recommendations and helps prioritize public health resources. And under the prevention strategies, there are four different strategies. And none of these are necessarily new. These are things that we've already probably been doing, um, but it does help, like I said, prioritize. Um, we kind of have uh, more direction um, and more recommendations as far as uh, what and who we should be targeting these activities for. Um, so the first strategy is conducting education. The second strategy is improving infection prevention and control practices. And the third strategy is to detect colonized individuals. And then the last one um, is to help facilitate communication. So for the prevention guidance, it really boils down to kind of who and what are we targeting here? So um, the priority organisms are gonna be based on those organisms that we believe are gonna be highest yield. And so that's gonna be MDROs in the early epidemiological stages. So kind of our, our tier two organisms. We do have the specific focus on, on Canada or as an NDM. Um, like I mentioned, our, our MDM is, is starting to increase some, and then obviously our, our C ORIS cases are increasing. So implementing prevention activities now, especially in regions of the state um, that have few cases will, will be the highest yield for these prevention activities. And then we do have specific priority facilities. Um, and so this, the CDC guidance uh, talks about influential facilities, and then highly connected facilities. And so this slide just really um, defines what that, that means. Um, so influential facilities have a large overall influence on the regional MDO prevalence. And so this will include all LTACs and VSNFs. This may also include facilities that have substantial transmission and are thought to impact regional prevalence. Um, and these would be identified during a containment response. And then highly connected facilities are acute care hospitals and skilled nursing facilities that most frequently receive patients from these influential facilities and are therefore likely to admit patients or residents with MDROs. So the local health departments, again, might ask you about your transfer patterns to really kind of identify these highly connected facilities and influential facilities. If you are not uh, considered an influential facility or a highly connected facility, um, in this guidance, you're, you're categorized as other. Um, and so, like I mentioned, this, this guidance really does help us target um, those at highest risk and those that will have the highest yield for some of these prevention activities and resources. Um, so I do want to go into the recommendations for activities that are highly recommended for influential facilities. Um, so this table is broken down by the four different strategies, the recommended activities, and then the VDH resources uh, for the facilities. Um, so under education, it's recommended to provide MDRO and IPC-based education to healthcare facilities during planned on-site visits, schedule IPC demonstrations or in-services, and then provide healthcare facilities with group educational opportunities. We do have some upcoming trainings, um, some upcoming um, in-person trainings as well um, that are listed on our VDH HIIR education website. Um, so definitely check out that website. And then we also have our HI and AR Navigator newsletter. Um, if you are not signed up to receive this newsletter, please do. Um, we do include a lot of our training opportunities in there as well. Under IPC, um, it's recommended to conduct prevention-driven recurring MDRO-focused infection control assessments. Um, so this is kind of at least yearly um, and provide follow-up and technical aid to mitigate identified gaps as needed. We do have a VDH proactive infection prevention and control assessment request form. So all you have to do is click on that link and fill out some information if your facility is interested. Um, and like I said, this is highly recommended for anyone uh, that would be considered an influential facility. There's also some screening recommendations. Um, so it's recommended for prevention-driven recurring point prevalence surveys at a predetermined frequency. It might be quarterly um, or every six months, depending on, on laboratory capacity. Um, there's also a recommendation for admission screening if it's early in the epidemic stage and the facility has performed a PPS and has good adherence to infection prevention and control practices as observed during the IPC assessment. 
Now, these strategies are not necessarily things that need to happen all at once or in a sequential order. You know, obviously education and communication can happen all the time. We will be requesting that prior to any screening for prevention, um, these facilities do have an on-site IPC assessment and, and gaps are addressed. Um, if anyone is interested in doing screening after sort of uh, the IPC assessment has happened, um, you can reach out to your local health department. Um, our public health lab uh, testing capacity is limited. However, I did mention as you know, we have more resources at the state level, um, this might be an opportunity in the future. <clears throat> And then lastly, communication. So understanding when, what, and how MDR-related information is communicated to the local health department and how the facility should be communicating within and between facilities. It's also recommended that we um, issue health alerts for clinicians and laboratories, and then support healthcare facilities to improve inter-facility communication within a region. Um, so I linked our VDH reportable disease list, um, our VDH clinician letters. We've now sent out um, three clinician letters regarding um, these targeted MDROs, specifically Canada Oris. Um, also link the CDC transfer form, and then um, the EDCC, um, if you want to see earlier slides regarding that. <laughs> and then here are the recommendations for highly connected facilities. Um, so the influential facilities are going to take a little bit more of a priority. Um, there are similar recommendations with, with some slight adjustments. So education recommendations are, are pretty similar. <laughs> So we want to provide MDO and IPC based education to healthcare facilities during these planned on site visits and provide healthcare facilities with group educational opportunities. Um, again, the MDO webinar series is something that we highly recommend um, everyone takes a look at. Under the IPC part, um, so whereas with the influential facilities, it was recurring um, and sort of scheduled, here we, uh, the recommendations are to conduct and sort of on an ad hoc basis. Um, so this might just be, you know, once a year as needed, um, but of course providing follow-up and technical aid to mitigate identified gaps as needed. Um, and you can of course use that same BDH proactive infection prevention and control assessment request form. Under screening, um, there actually isn't any screening that is highly recommended. There is a, a one recommendation um, to potentially do an ad hoc PPS. So again, not like any sort of recurring regularly scheduled PPS, um, but maybe a, a one off. Um, again, reaching out to the local health department, um, the capacity is limited. And so this really will be the uh, public health testing is really prioritized for response actions or even some of that the influential uh, screening that's recommended that's highly recommended by the prevention guidance. Mm -hmm. And then lastly communication very similar um, and have, have the similar same same resources uh, for these facilities. Um, so what should facilities do now? Um, so really you want to update any facility policies or protocols for targeted MDROs um, with the updated guidance. Influential and highly connected facilities, please consider prevention strategies that I just talked about. Um, you can request a proactive onsite assessment using that link. Continue to report cases and work with your local health department to prevent transmission. Um, so we are under the process of updating a lot of our documents that we share with facilities um, to reflect the updated practices and updated guidance. Um, so be patient as we work through that. Um, but please send questions regarding new guidance to your local health departments. We already have a list of questions that we're planning on getting answered from CDC. As we work through these, we expect more questions to come up. Um, and so we will you know, work with our CDC partners to provide answers. Um, and then depending on if we're continue to get sort of the same questions, of course, we can create, create additional FAQs um, if it's deemed necessary. So, um, you know, we're, so like I said, we're all in this together. Um, and so we're going to be implementing this new guidance as we start to get these cases reported to us, um, updating the, those guidance documents and working through, through these new recommendations to prevent transmission. And that is all I have for today. Um, so I can take questions. I can uh, look at the chat here. Laura, you can probably stop recording now.